Good morning. Say happy Father's Day to all you fathers. Uh, if you got a workbook, we're going to be on page 36. Where we're going to start. It's going to be 1 Samuel chapter 2. If you're following along in your Bible. 1 Samuel 2. Start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord, to be able to stand up here again. Lord, I pray that you'd remove me just as far as you can, Lord, that your people might get some help. I'm thankful for all the fathers that are here, Lord, and ultimately that you are our Father. I'm thankful for that, Lord, and I'm thankful for all the blessings and the mercy that you have on us. I'm just grateful, Lord, and I just pray that you'd help us to learn something from your word, and that you might be glorified through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, 1 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 2, starting verse 22. It says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. You know, some of these stories that you read, like, some people say, like, oh, the Bible or the Old Testament's boring, and it's not any fun. There's some of these stories in here that are, like, crazy, right? Like, some of the stuff that you learn about, like, you see where all movies today, they all get their plot lines and their twists and all their... It's all comes... It's all Bible stuff. Like, it's all, that's where it all comes from. All these different stories and the way that they all work. Um, there's a lot to be gained from all these Old Testament stories. In Romans 15, Romans 15, uh, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, it's talking about like the Old Testament things that were written in the past, it says they were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So we're supposed to take these things that are written in the Old Testament and, and before and, and just learn from them and use them in our lives and learn how to how to grow, and this, this whole unit that we're doing now is on mentoring, how to be a, an effective mentor, and the different struggles and trials that come with that. And we're going to learn today about Eli, and about Samuel, and about Eli's sons. Um, Eli was a high priest. Um, by all accounts, up to this point, was a good man. He served God faithfully, right? Um, he just had one really big problem. He had two sons. Um, I'm going to pronounce these horribly wrong, I'm sure, but Hophni and Phineas, uh, Samuel 11, verse 12, calls them sons of Bilal. That's like sons of wickedness, evil, okay? It says that they lay with the women of the tabernacle. So these were women that were set aside. They were dedicated to God. If you look in Exodus, chapter 38, verse 8, it says, And he made the labors of brass, and the foot of it of brass, of the uh, looking glass, of the women assembled, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. These women were set aside holy women who had devoted their lives to God. Okay? They were holy women. And these sons were taking advantage of something that was given to God. These women had been had given and, and given everything that they had, right? Their purity, their mind, their self, they had given and devoted to God. And these sons, these, these two boys were taking advantage of those things with the position that they or that their father had, right? So first they were doing that. These were vile men, okay? It says that they would steal parts of the sacrifice. So the way that it would work is, is when there would be a sacrifice, they would take this big hook and they would stick this hook down in there and whatever they pulled out was the priest they could keep, the rest was God's. But that's not how they did it. Right? They did, and they kept whatever they wanted. It says that they were keeping the best parts of the sacrifice and that they were eating, and we'll learn more about that in a minute. But the hard part to understand is that these boys were, were as immersed in the things of God as you could be. You couldn't have grown up in a more holy, sanctified, set-apart set place. They, their father was the high priest. You, you're not going to get any, any closer than that, right? And even though that that's where they grew up, they still, it didn't help them. It didn't change anything, right? Either they took it for granted or they didn't care. But that just goes to show you that it doesn't matter who your dad is or who your grandpa is or it doesn't matter who your family is or how prominent they are in the church. It doesn't matter if you've grown up in church your whole life. That's not enough to get you to heaven. That isn't enough to get you where you need to be with God. That will not help you. It doesn't help you at all. It didn't help them at all, even a little bit, right? Um. God had a clear intention for these two boys. The way that it worked is, is your family, whoever your, like if your father was the priest, then you would become the priest. And then your sons would become, it was a lineage, it was a line. It was the way it was supposed to work that God had intended for it. And they ruined what God had intended. And 
a lot of times we, can ru- we ruin what God had intended. All right? I'm sure, and I heard it, this old preacher say one time, he said, I bet when we get to heaven, we'll go and we'll look at this big screen and God will show us all the things we could have done or all the things He had in store for us, the way that he, he wanted our lives to go, but all of our bad decisions, all of our choices that were selfish and sinful and prideful and arrogant, all those things turned us to, a, to the way that we wanted to go. And then God can always turn a mess into a miracle. That's not, that's always, okay? God turned my life around and He made a miracle out of a, out of a homeless drug addict, okay? But that God's intention for my life was not for me to get addicted to drugs, was not for me to be homeless, was not for me to be those things. Now, he'll turn them and use them as a testimony, and, and, and he'll, he'll allow them to be used to glorify him, but that's not his intention, and that's not what the intention for these two boys were. God had a great intention for these two boys. Um, and normally, see, the two, the, two guys that, the two sons that were so wicked, that shouldn't necessarily have a, have a standing or an effect on, or have an effect on um, Eli's standing with God. That shouldn't affect, if you um, raise your children in church, their entire lives, right? And then at some point they rebel and they just go and do some wicked, horrible, vile things. That, that doesn't have an effect on your standing with God. That, will, that doesn't mean you, you're not saved. That doesn't mean you're judged on behalf of what they do. Now, you are the high priest of your home. You are supposed to take care and direct and guide your children. And we'll get into that in a little while. But as far as like you paying and, and being judged for the sins of your children, that's not normally, that's not what happens today. You are not held reliable for that, Right? But what happens is in verse 29, he says, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel for my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed, that thy house and thy house of thy father should walk before me forever. So he's saying that the lineage would continue forever. Your fathers and then your sons would continue this lineage. But he says, uh, but be it, bar, be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So the, the plan God had changed because he clearly says that they, you and honors thy sons above me. So Eli was worried more about his sons, what they thought, what they cared, hurting their feelings, discouraging them, than he was of God being discouraged and God being upset. That's right, that's right. Now, what do we honor more than God? Because that's... That seems like, well, I would never do that. I would never let something, I would never put something be, you know, before God. But it's all throughout the Bible. I mean, if there's something that you're going to do in place of church, that's something, and I'm not talking about if you're sick, or I'm talking about like, well, I really, this is to be fun, I can't wait to go do this. Not a vacation, but you going and doing things that you're putting above church. That's something you're honoring. That's a false God. And you putting something before God continually over and over and over, you are honoring something more than you're honoring God. Also, when you put somebody's feelings above God, when you're afraid to tell somebody, you don't want to offend that person because you don't want to upset them, but they're blatantly disregarding the will of God, and you know that, and they're, they're like, say, your family. You're, you know, today is Father's Day, and this lesson is, is a lot to do with fathers and the different ways that you will see the different ways that... Um, how a father responds to their sons or how a mother responds to their sons, it changes the outcome of that child's life. Okay? Well, that's your responsibility. And if you're just trying to be a, a dad that is a friend or a dad that is just like, you know what, it's okay, we'll figure it out. It's, that's, that's wrong. That's not the call that God gave you. God gave you a specific call to be a man, to be a man and a father and a husband and a, and a leader in your home. And that's your job. That's your God-given call. Every husband is called in that same way. Every father is called that same way. You're not called to be a friend. You're called to be a father. And what happened is, is Eli cared more about and honored his sons above the honor of the father. And, the, and it got him in a mess. It got him in a real bad problem. Um, verse 23. Verse 23 says, And he said unto them, Why do you use such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. So Eli is the high priest in Israel. But he should have been... He should have also been the high priest in his home. And that's where he failed. Because you are the high priest of your home. You are responsible for your family. That's, right. that's, the, that's your job. That's what God called you to do. And obviously, like, me and my wife, we are a team. Every, like, she is my better half. She, is, she completes me in ways I don't even know I needed to be completed. She makes me a better man, right? But ultimately, it says the man is the head of the home. That's where God pointed and put the leadership. But guess what? 
if you're doing what you're supposed to, because if the wife is submitting to the husband, the husband's in the same position because he's submitting to God the same way the wife's submitting to the husband. We're all in submission. It works the same way. And if the man is submitting to God the way he should, and the sons are submitting to the father the way they should, and the wife, it just works as a unit the way God created it. And it's not forced. You're not a dictator. You're not ruling with an iron fist. It doesn't work that way. It's love. You are able, you're, because I love God more than I love my wife, I am able to love my wife more than I could on my own. Okay? And she loves God more than she loves me. The reason that I don't do anything to hurt my wife, yes, I love her. That's, that's important. But because first I don't want to disappoint God. And that's where, my, that's where my, um, my morals lie, is in my relationship with God first. And then everything else will take care of itself. Everything else will be the way it's supposed to be. And Eli's, Eli's priorities were out of whack. Something was off. Something was not right for him to not have been leading his sons the way he knew he should have. He would have been held to a higher standard. He knew more than anybody. He should have known better than anybody. He was the one the people came to. He was the one that got asked the questions. He was the one that was supposed to know these things. And God allowed him to have two sons to carry on the lineage of what he was supposed to do. And rather than teach them, rather than show them, rather than correct or rebuke them when he should have, he allowed them to continue what they were doing and it destroyed everything. It didn't just destroy their lives. It destroyed his entire lineage of his family's lives. Everything. And we're going to learn more about that as we keep going, but it's just important. Like You've got to think about the calling that God has put on your life. It's Father's Day, and that's what you're supposed to be as a father. We're not supposed to be just friends. It's okay to be a friend and okay to, to be loving. It should all be done in lovingness and, and, lovingness and kindness and gentleness. That's the way you're, you know, you're not, it says, Fathers, provoke not your sons to anger, okay? You're not supposed to be mean and, and hateful all the time, but you are supposed to raise them up in the way that they should go. That's the way the Bible tells you. You're supposed to correct them. That's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, now, the thing, turning a blind eye to their sin, okay, and especially in concerning the things of God, this wasn't just like a secret thing. This was known to everybody. He said, all the people of Israel are coming and telling me what's going on, okay? So, Eli, he could have saved his sons in his, in his self, but instead, what he did, or what he didn't do, cost him everything. Verse 24 says, Nay, my sons, for it is, not, it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. God saw this as punishable by death. That's how serious he took it. God saw what them two boys did as punishable by death. And Eli just simply said, Nay, don't do, don't do that. And he didn't, and if you realize Later on, we'll see even more that he's not even saying he's like, what you're doing is wrong. He said, you're making the Lord's people sin. And we're going to see in a minute when he talks about the judges and how he's like, well, it's not just against the people, but it's against God. He wasn't worried about what they were specifically doing. He wasn't correcting them. He was like, what you do is it's not a good thing. What I'm hearing isn't good. Not what you're doing isn't good, but that I'm hearing it isn't good. Not that look, what you're doing is against God, but look at what all the people are saying. He was concerned about that more than he cared about what God was, what God was uh, disappointed in. And there was no discipline. They took anything they wanted. They took the women that they wanted. They took all the food that they wanted. They took any, anything that they wanted, they had. They were never stopped. By, by the only person that could have stopped them up until God stepped in and stopped them ultimately, Eli never did. Um, and it, it ends up costing him more than just, just his sons. Just, the worst that could have happened is if he would have rebuked them and stopped them is they might have got angry. They might have got mad. They may have been, uh, they may have left. They may have, whatever. But they'd have been alive. They would, have been, they would still have been alive if, they, if he would have stopped them and, and stopped them from this. Verse 25 says, If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if, he, but if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Okay. Eli, all he was worried about was how to help his boys out of trouble. He said, if you sin against another man... The judge can help you. Well, who is the judge? But who's, so he's saying, right? He says, if you sin against a man, the judge shall judge him. But if you sin against the Lord, the Lord's going to judge you. Well, Eli had the power and the position to be able to judge. So if his sons go out and sin against another man, he can, he can help them. He can protect them. He can stop all this. But if it's against God, he knows he can't help them. He can't, he can't stop God. He said, who can entreat for you? Not 
What you're doing is bad against God, but what you've done, I can't get you out of. If you sin against God, I can't entreat for you. I can't go help you. There's nothing I can do now. But the verse tells us that they die. So they didn't listen. And Eli either didn't get the message through. Eli, they had to know regardless, right? They had to know that ultimately, and Eli knew ultimately he could get through to them. He had ways. He could have just like completely cut them off. He could have stopped them. The way that they gained the power and the position that they had was because of who their dad was. He could have stopped that. He had the ability to stop that. Right? When he found out that they were abusing their power, they were abusing these women, they were taking more of the sacrifice than they should. But he didn't. And in, ver- in chapter 3, if you flip over to chapter 3, verse 14... It says, And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. God said, What you have done, there is no sacrifice that's going to take away. And that just makes me so, so thankful that I live on this side of the cross when all my sins have been taken care of. Every sin has been purged. There is nothing that can be held against me. There is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Because the Bible says right here, he said, it doesn't matter what you do. I don't care what, what sacrifice you bring, it will not be enough to get rid of this. That's a scary thought to think that you have so angered God, a forgiving and a gracious God, that he said, you tell them that there's nothing. Nothing they can do. Their sin will not be purged. There's nothing they can do. And it says, And Samuel lay unto the, Samuel lay unto the morning and opened, and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. This is a scary thing. And we're going to see in just a second about how, how all this was put on to Samuel. But to, tell, to have to tell Eli that, look, God said there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. The judgment had been passed. And there will come a time, and we will get to a place, like if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you'll stand before Him one day, and there will be no, there will be no time for purging. There will be no sacrifice left. You didn't accept the sacrifice that was given. When you stand at the great white throne, and you're looking up at God, and He's judging you for the fact that you didn't accept His Son, and the free gift that was given, it'll be just as scary as it was, because there'll be no more sacrifice. There's no more time. You're out. You're out of time. And... That's why it's just so, I'm so, it's, it's crazy to think that there was a time when things were like that. And now, the free gift of salvation where all sins are forgiven, and people don't take it. People don't, people don't, don't take it seriously. Just like Eli wasn't taking what his sons were doing seriously, right? Um, God had already gotten ready the successor. He was already, there was already a successor to the priesthood already there. Right? God had made a, prom- a promise through Samuel's mother that he would raise up him and that he would be a part of all these things of God. And verse 26 says, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with the men. Samuel was a gift. He was a gift from the Lord to Hannah. Hannah couldn't have children, right? She was mocked by the fact that she couldn't have children. People would make fun of her. And she prayed and prayed and asked God, and and God said He would give her a child. And she said, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. I will let you have him. And how much of a difference that is between the way Samuel, or the way Eli had his two sons, that that God gave him, that were already lined up to take on the role of, and be these priests that they should have been, and he didn't. And Hannah took her son. That would have been the greatest gift she could have been given. She didn't have a son. And, and the people make fun of her. She was, she was down. She was depressed. She was crying because she didn't have a kid. Then God gives her a son, and, and she doesn't get to even keep him. She gets to give him back to God. Amen. But see, Eli's sons were already, already so wrapped up in the things of God, but they were never given to God. They never gave themselves to God. They were never, they were never um, part uh, and never took on the way God wanted them to. So... God gave Eli another chance because Eli gets to raise Samuel, right? Well, God found favor in him. Eli was a good man. The only fault that it records of him having is the, is the faults of his sons. The rest of the entire chapter is God's future judgment. That's the rest of the, of the entire chapter of chapter 2 is all about just the judgment that was coming, what God was going to do to his family, not just him, not just his sons, but... It talks about how both of his sons would die in a day, that eventually they would be begging and pleading for bread, all these things that would happen. But they didn't happen right then. 
It was years down the road that they happened. So Samuel, or so Eli knew that these things were coming. It was something he knew that was heavy on his heart that he was always probably thinking about, right? And God said that he would raise up a priest and that the priest that he raised up would do his will. Unlike the way Eli, unlike the Eli didn't, and that was Samuel. Samuel was a fulfilled promise multiple times over. He was a fulfilled promise from God to Hannah. He was a fulfilled promise when he became the priest. He was a fulfilled promise to Eli because the judgment came through. And if, like He had to raise up his successor. And he had another chance, and he did better with the second chance he got. But it still didn't change the outcome. If you turn the page... In this chapter 3, in verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. The beginning of chapter 3, what's happening is Samuel's lying here sleeping, and his voice keeps calling to him. And he hears the voice, and he thinks it's Eli. So he jumps up, and he runs down, and he's like, You called for me. And he's like, I didn't call for you. He's like, I heard somebody calling. So he's like, Go lay back down. So he goes and lays back down. This happens multiple times, over and over and over. And I was reading this historian said that um, uh, Samuel would have been favored by Eli because if he would have been that close to him when he was sleeping, close enough that he could hear him, like he ministered unto, unto Eli. He was close to him. He cared about him. They, like he was in a favored position. And it says God favored him and the men favored him. But he had to be close enough with an earshot to hear him. And that's not everybody didn't get to be that close to the, to the high priest. So he hears him call him. He thought it was Eli. And I started thinking about all the times God called me. And, and so God's calling after, he's calling after Samuel. He's calling. Now Samuel didn't know what it was, but he still runs toward the call. And I feel like when I started thinking about that, how fast and how hard I ran away from the call of God. I ran in the other direction. I didn't want nothing to do with any of that stuff. Like I didn't want any, any part of whatever this was, any of this, like, this life that was given to God. I didn't want any part of that. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to just, I wanted to be selfish. That's what I was. Um, I thought I had a control over I thought I was in control of my life. I thought if, anybody, if I could have just took a second and turned around and looked at myself the way everybody else seen me, I would have seen it was imploding and I couldn't That's even right. tell it. Because right. when you're in the eye of a hurricane, it seems calm, right? But everything around you is chaos. I felt safe. I felt secure. And everything was, was crazy. But I'm just glad that he kept calling. Amen. He kept calling. He kept calling until eventually I answered this call that he was putting on my life. And if, if you're being called by God... You're not guaranteed that he'll keep calling. That's right. We need to always answer this call if, you, if you're feeling this conviction or God's working in your heart. It, it, it's a blessing and it's a miracle that he continues to call after he doesn't have to because he died for you Amen. and then also called you and you did not answer. He doesn't have to call again. That's right. He didn't have to send his son. He doesn't have to call you the first time. The information's there. You should, we sh it seems like we should have to go to Him. Amen. But He always comes to us. I don't know why He's so good to us and why He does that, but He always comes to us. And this, this calling that keeps happening, right? It keeps happening over and over. And he had, he, or, um, Samuel had served around the things of God. He had the same luxury in the same way that Phineas and the other, both the sons had, both of Eli's sons. He grew up in those same ways. He was around the things of God, but he didn't know yet. And I looked it up everywhere. I looked it up said that the closest they could figure is that um, Samuel was probably around 12-ish. That's the closest I could find. He was around 12. And that shows you, like, growing up religious doesn't matter. He had spent all this time around God the same way the sons did. And, and God called them probably, obviously, the same way he would have called those two sons. And they rejected that call. The most important thing in my life as a father is that my little boy one day gets saved. That is the only thing that I'm concerned with at this point, like as far as like for my family. My wife is saved. I am saved. We're going to heaven. My little boy is six years old. And as of yet, he's... The other day, we had a baptism here. We went down to the creek and um, we had some people get baptized, and it was awesome. And on the way home, he said, why can't I get baptized? And I said, well, buddy, you got you to gotta get saved first. He said, yeah. Why don't I do that? Why don't I get saved? And I was like, well, I said, so listen, you, you got to know some things. Like, you, we got to know that, that Jesus died for us. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you got um, to know that like, you, have to, you have to ask him into your heart. You have to understand that he died for your sins. Yeah, I know all that. I know. I'm sitting here thinking, like, what, like, 
And, and he said, I said, well, buddy, what happens is, is that like the Holy Spirit will start to deal with your heart and God knocks on your heart and you know and He's calling you and, and conviction takes place and the Holy Spirit does this amazing. He's like, well, what's that? And right then I'm like, okay, so th- that is the difference right now. But what scares me so bad is I don't want to rush it. I don't want him to be like, he's like, you know, well, I'm going to get saved. And I don't want to be like, okay, then just repeat after me what I say and then him think he saved the rest of his life. But I also don't want to push it and say, well, wait, just hold on, and then him lose interest in it. Amen. I don't know where that's at. Y'all pray for me. I'm trying to figure out where this fine line is at. I'm so thankful that he has an interest in the things of God. He knows the Bible more than most grown men that I know. He can quote scripture. He, he, but it's not just a head knowledge that is where you get where salvation takes place. It takes place in your heart. And I keep telling him, I'm like, listen, he goes, well, I'm not saved. I want to go to heaven. I said, but you may not be saved right now, but right now you're safe. And there's a difference. You're safe until you're old enough to understand the difference, and then you have to get saved. Amen. But up until that point, until you're old enough to understand the difference between sin, between um, right and wrong, and knowing that what your sin is is against God. There's, a, there's an age that comes where you become a- able to discern those different things. And I would say it's probably different for a lot of different people. People come to that age different times. They mature at different times. But it's important to me. That's the most important thing to me. So when he says, well, I want to do it, Man, everything in me wants to be like, all right, let's do it. Like, I, like, come on, you're right. You know what? I'm with you. Let's go. But I don't ever want to want to lead him in the wrong way or, or give him some kind of a false sense of security that isn't that isn't from God. And then him be confused his whole life because no, my daddy said I was saved. My daddy told me I was saved. I want him to know it. Amen. And there'll come a day when he'll come to me and he'll say that he's ready. And I know that because I've prayed too much about it. I know God will show me when that time's right. God will lead my heart to be able to. To be able to start to witness to him and show him and help him. Because that's just how God is. I know that. Um, but as of yet, Samuel didn't know. It says the word had not been revealed. So that's an important time because he didn't know yet. And God's trying to, to, to reach him. God's making that call. He's reaching out to him. And there's something special is about to happen. Um, in verse 8, it says, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I. For thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. So after everything, all these things that have happened, all the bad stuff that's happened with Eli and everything, Eli still was able to see and know and discern something was different. There was something going on. And Samuel had answered three times to a call that Eli didn't hear. Well, he knows Samuel's not lying about it, right? So Eli is convinced there's something spiritual going on. Like, this is something different. This isn't, like, he's not crazy. You know, somebody's not calling. I could hear it. Well, chapter 3, if you're in chapter 3, verse 1 says, And the child Samuel uh, ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Well, the word of the Lord was precious because there was no vision. That means there was no prophet. There was no prophet openly speaking on the behalf of God at the time. There was no open vision. So there was nobody that was continually, the word of the Lord, like today... The word of the Lord is everywhere. Like we have the ability at this church and at another church. And if you're, you know, tonight at home, like each one of us individually can have the word of the Lord. We can hold it physically. We can physically hold the word of the Lord in our hands, right? We have, there is no need for an open vision because we have the full vision in our hand. We're able to hold that, okay? So we can have that full vision. Also, the living Lord lives inside of us. So we have his word and his spirit and we're able to connect these things. That was not so then. They didn't have that. So anytime the Lord spoke, it was precious. It was serious. Everybody listened and they took, they took um, notice of what was going on. So when Samuel heard it, but Eli didn't, and Eli's the priest and Samuel's a child, that's got to be concerning for him because there's a judgment he knows is coming one day. There is an eventual judgment that's coming. There is going to be a time when this is passed on. There is going to be a time when This judgment that he knows is coming, that God promised. He knows God's faithful, and he knows it's going to happen. So that's probably the first thing he thought of when he heard that Samuel is now hearing this call of the Lord that he isn't getting to hear. So, verse 9. Verse 9, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So, I'm sure... That when, when, when God speaks, 
And Samuel obviously doesn't have a clue what's going on. He didn't know the Lord. He never heard the Lord. There's not an open vision. There's no prophet speaking. So the Lord speaking wasn't a common occurrence. It was a precious thing. And so he's probably confused. And Eli's trying to guide him and help him and show him. He's like, okay, listen, go lie down. If it's God and He calls again, you answer in this way. And I started thinking about that. Like, when the Lord calls us, do we answer that way? Do we say, yes, Lord, your servant here, I'm here. What do you need? I'm your servant. I'm listening. I don't feel like we answer that way. That, and that's the way that He told him to answer when He called him. That's a good, that's a good practice, right? Like, speak, Lord, your servant here. I can hear you. What, do you. what do you need me to do? What is it that you have for me? Lord, I'm listening, right? We get, too, we get too busy with our lives. See, because we're like spiritually spoiled. I really believe that. That's what it is. <laughs> I believe that like, you know, we have Bibles that we don't read Amen. and prayer, uh, power and prayer that we don't use, uh, altars that nobody's come to, That's right. sermons that are God-given to the preacher that we don't apply to our lives Amen. because we're spoiled. That's right. Because there'll be one next week. That's right. Because we can always read tomorrow night. That's right? right? It's okay, we didn't get to pray. We'll pray tomorrow. We'll pray later. We'll, do, we'll, we'll make up that time another time because we're spoiled with the ability to always have these things. But what if you couldn't? What if you could only go to the altar when, when God opened it? What if you could only hear and talk to God? Not when you read the Bible, but when He decided it was time to speak to you. That's how it was then. I think we'd be, it would be a lot more precious to us, but because we're so, it's just all open to us. But you think, we are going to be held to a lot higher standard because we had the ability to get these things and didn't. We had the ability. And it's so silly sometimes the things we struggle with, the things that we don't, we don't use. We'll struggle with something that God has said over and over, just bring it to me and I'll take it. That's right. But we don't give it. Amen. We don't want to go to an altar and give it to Him. We have all these issues and these problems, and God said that every answer to every question is written inside this book. Right. But we don't open it and read it. God gives Brother Bill specific sermons to touch our hearts, and we come in hardened and bitter and angry, and just, you know, you just came in so you could get out. You came in, and you can't wait till 12 o'clock when it's over. And that, if you're just coming to just like say, hey, I went to church this week, you're wasting your time. You have to come with a willingness to receive what God has given to you. Amen. This place, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's where a relationship is cultivated. It's a relationship between you and God, that's right. and that's the most important relationship. But it's also a relationship between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ that gets cultivated. And that's why it is so important. If you're not coming to the uh, Wednesday night Bible study that we're having, you are missing out on something that is a great blessing from God. Because every time that I've been, it's, there's, there's such a, a, an openness, such a, a spirit of God moving and God allowing and, and, and God allowing knowledge to happen and it otherwise isn't happening because this isn't like you could read these same things sitting at your house but when we come and we do it together as a group it, 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 it the Lord allows it for some reason to be expounded on differently and for you to receive it right. um, and and you know that that's of God because the Holy Spirit leads us to understanding so if you're learning and understanding more it's because the Holy Spirit is leading it's not a something of the flesh it's not a uh, it's not a person thing. It's a God thing. And just like this, God was speaking. And when God spoke, they listened. We need to make sure that we're taking the things and the blessings that God gives us serious and how blessed we are to have all these things that are just open to us. That we have all, that we're, we're just so blessed and we need to make a big deal of it. That's right. It's supposed to be a big deal. They made a big deal of it and they hardly ever got it. We have it all the time. We treat it like it's just whatever. Verse 10 says, And the Lord came and stood and called us at other called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant here. You know, the Lord moved before Samuel answered. He moved again. He moved closer. And he shouldn't have to do that. But that just shows you how much he loves you. That he moves to you. He comes to you. He'll come to right where you're sitting right now. And he'll knock on your heart. He doesn't wait. He doesn't wait until you get up and come to the altar. He comes and gets you where you're sitting. He starts working on your heart from way back there. He doesn't make, he doesn't make you make that first move. He makes the first move. And, you know, we're important to Him. He, we matter to Him the same way Samuel did. Samuel did exactly what the man of God told him to do. He listened. He went and laid back down. He, he responded the exact way that he told him to. And, you know, that's the first conversation that him and God had. 
As he said, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Speak, Lord. The first time that they ever spoke was right then. And Eli had helped him and guided him and showed him how to do that, right? And he had mentored him and taught him that right way. And it reminded me the same way that Brother Bill would stand up here and just preach and teach and tell you, right? You, he tells you about conviction, about going to hell if you die without Jesus. He tells you all this. He's trying to mentor you and introduce you into that first conversation That's that right. you and God are going to have. When God knocks on your heart and you respond, and that, that starts that relationship that you can have. He is that man of God. He is that who stands in the gap and bridges that gap between the lost world and a calling God. And He's calling out. And he's trying to tell you and reach you and help you and show you, right? Um, and then from that point on, from that first moment that you have, that first interaction with God, from t for the rest of time and in eternity, you're able to have that, re that relationship with Him. Nothing can come between. Nothing. There's nothing that can break that down. We are able to have all the blessings that all these men throughout the entire Old Testament got to have. We are able to walk with God the way Adam, the same way like Adam did, with that same closeness. You can commune with God in an open way like Moses got to. You can learn from, from Jesus and from the Bible the way the disciples did. You can get converted the same way Paul did. All these different stories that come together and you get to have all that. You get to have every bit of that. This, you can get called the same way He called Samuel. The same way. It's all the same. And we get all that. And it's all available because of Jesus. Because of Christ. But you have to answer. He's always knocking. That's right. But He's not going to come in unless you answer and unless you let Him in. That's right. Because if Samuel would not have said, Speak, Lord, your servant heareth, he would not have spoke. He already called three times. And he didn't say anything. Until he answered back, then God did something. God would have stood there and said, Samuel, Samuel. He would have continued to call him. But that doesn't start until he answers back. Amen. Verse 15 on the next page says, And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to shoot Eli the vision. Samuel grew up ministering to Eli. This wasn't a stranger. This was someone he knew, someone he cared about. This was someone that, that was important to him. Not just important to him, but someone that he respected, that he looked up to, someone that was a leader and a mentor, and somebody that had like a voice in his life. And Samuel knew that this was true, that this was the voice of God. And he laid there scared to tell Eli. But if I had to bet, I bet Eli probably laid there scared too all night. Because he knew God spoke. And he knew God spoke to him for a reason. And if he's laying there, he, they probably both laid awake in separate rooms, awake all night, just waiting to hear what the other one had to say. Because he knew that it was something important. He knew if God came and said something, it was important. And he knew as soon as he got up, because the first thing he runs in and says is, is, come tell me what he said. I want to know, what did God say? Don't keep it from me, tell me, right? And he doesn't tell us necessarily um, if, if Samuel knew all the stuff that Eli and his sons had did. It doesn't say, it doesn't tell us if he knew all that stuff. But God told him that he was for the iniquity. But God said he knows that it's for the iniquity. God told Samuel that he knew that. All the way back in chapter 2, verse 12, he knew from then that this was coming, right? Now, that's a lot for a 12-year-old. I say 12, that's what they, they say. I don't know if that's true. Either way, he was a, he was a young child, young man, right? Um, that's a lot. That's, right. that's a heavy thing to have to hold for such a young person. The first time that you have a communication with the Lord is to go tell this man that you love and respect and admire that God's judgment is coming. That's a lot. That's heavy, right? Amen. But you know what? We have to do that too. Because from the moment you get saved and the moment you know, you are held responsible for the people in your life. That that is your, is your call from God to make sure that you go tell those people. And it may be hard. Because it's hard to tell somebody you love but that you know is lost and doesn't have God that if they don't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior that they're going to go and that they're going to die and they're going to burn for eternity in a place called hell. That's heavy. That's a lot to have to hold to have to tell somebody. If you have to go talk to your mom or your dad or your brothers, your sisters, your family, your best friend. But you have to tell them. Samuel had to tell Eli. He had to tell him regardless of the outcome. Because ultimately, you're a messenger. The judgment comes between God and that person. The gospel is good news. But it's only good news to those that receive it. If you don't receive it, it's condemnation. That's right. If you don't receive it and you don't accept it, you're condemned. But you still have to give it like it's good news. That's 
you still have to tell every person like they're going to accept it. You have to tell every person like they're going to get saved. That's, how, that's your responsibility. God put that much on him because he knew he would tell him. He knew he would. And if there's somebody in your life that God is telling you to call, God put that on you and he gave you the ability to do it. Do not let your pride or your fear or whatever, whatever emotion or whatever selfish thing it would be, because that's all it could be. It is a selfish thing to not tell somebody about the gospel. Because if you knew that there was a hole out here in the road and there was fire coming out of it and it was this big pit and people are driving down the road, how dare you not go stand way up there and start yelling at people to stop their cars? You'd never watch them drive. Well, I don't want to make, I don't want to make them mad. They're going to die. You better jump out in the road. Come get a bunch of people to come help you. Jump up and down. Lay down. Do whatever you got to do. Don't let them die. But we treat it like, I oh, will tell them another time. You don't know if you have more time. That's right. You don't know if you have tomorrow. Or less, you don't know if they do. Right. Amen. If you have an opportunity to speak truth into their lives, that is your job. Amen. And if God has given you that opportunity, you have to take that. Because that's obedience. Right. And if you delay, Brother Bill calls it disobedience. Exactly. I'll tell you a crazy story real quick. I'm about to be done. I was at work the other day. Sean works for me. He was there. It was this crazy thing. We all sat down at lunch, and there's these two Spanish guys. They're both from Mexico. They speak um, about as much English as I speak Spanish. I can speak some pretty decent Spanish, but it's all work-related, right? Everything that I, I know is work-related. Um, and I'm speaking to them, and the guy was sitting there, and he looked at me, and he said, I, he said it in a lot less English than I'm going to say, but he said, I've never worked with somebody like you guys. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've never met white guys that are Christians. I was like, oh, yeah? He said, yeah, I don't, I don't know anything. I don't know about that. I was like, yeah. He said, so, so if we died right now, what would happen? I said, if you don't have Jesus and you die right now, you go to hell. If you die and you have Jesus in your heart, you go to heaven. He said, like, right now, there's no place in between. Because most Spanish people that I have met have, like, a Catholic upbringing, and they believe in a purgatory, and, and you can pray people to heaven, all this stuff. Um, he said, so right now. And he starts asking me about, like, well, how, so the body's in the ground. And what if, like, when, when Jesus comes back and how, he had so many questions. Yeah. And this, this may be, I may be the only person ever that this happens to. But I was talking to my sister about it too the other day. And my wife, this is, this crazy thing happens, right? So when I start to talk to somebody about Jesus, I get this really nervous feeling at first, yeah. right? And I get this, like, butterflies and I'm, like, scared. And, like, I don't know what I'm really about to say. But then there comes this point where I get chills throughout my whole body. And it's almost like it's, like... The Lord's like, all right, son, let's go. And we just get, and I'm just like spitting. It ain't me. I don't know even what I'm half the time saying. You don't even, I'm just spitting out verses. And I don't know how in the world, but these men were understanding what I was saying. I was speaking. They were asking questions relevant to, to real life stuff. Amen. I was Googling as fast as I could how to translate this word and that word. And how to, like, I was telling them, ask Jesus in your heart in Spanish. I was giving all, all of it to them. And the one guy kept saying, yeah, but I'm not a good person. I'm like, no, Jesus was a good person. You don't have... Listen, it was crazy. We're only supposed to have 30 minutes for lunch. It was an hour-long lunch we were out there. I'm the boss. That's okay. We're going after it, and I'm just... We're going all this different stuff. All, like, we're just going after it. And it was so awesome. And I know God was there because I start telling him about Jesus, and, like, tears come to my eyes, and I don't know why. I get so excited and so ready to tell him. But then I was like... These men were so hungry to know about God. But if they wouldn't have asked me, would I have told them? Amen. Because they had the same hunger yesterday. That's right. And I didn't tell them. They asked me. And then I told them when they made it okay. Amen. Then men were just as lost the day before that. And every day they've worked for me. They were just as hungry and eager to learn about God every day. And if they wouldn't have brought it up, I don't know when I would have. And that made me feel regretful in my heart that I was not a better steward of the time and the people that God has put in my life to have brought that to them sooner. Because that's my job. And yes, no, they did not get saved right then. I don't know. All I know is that there is a seed that has been planted and it is, it is there. And I know that they understood. And, and I know that I did what God wanted me to do. I am, I am confident in that. But if there's people that God has put into your life, I would have never, if you would have asked me to pick 10 people that I knew that I thought had a want to know about Jesus, I would not have picked those two men. But they wanted to know. 
You never know what God's doing and dealing and moving in people's hearts. Just be faithful and take a step forward. Maybe they tell you to shut up and they don't care. But that's, that's not on you. You're responsible to take care of what God puts you in charge of. It's also a perfect example, though, that your lives outside of church makes a difference. If you're outside of church and you're not acting like a Christian, you're not representing Christ, then... People aren't going to be able to, like, you guys being at work and representing Christ, especially in a construction setting, for them to feel comfortable enough that, okay, these guys are Christian enough that I can go and ask them about the Lord. That's important to, to still have that testimony everywhere you go, not just at church. And that, yeah. that goes back, too, about what we were talking about between Brother Jason's lesson and the last lesson that I was teaching about being a mentor and how your testimony, just being consistent that's day right. after day, and just, any, it's, that's just being a child of God. That's right. Living a holy life that is separated for God, not just when you come to church, not just when you're around the people of God, but all the time. And when you can do that, and when you're able to be that same person consistently, then it allows those people to feel like they can trust you, and it, it allows God for, to give place in their lives and to have a voice in their lives. Um, right. Uh, verse 16 and 17, And Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God, do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me, all the things that thou hast said unto me. I wonder, right? Because he knew that this was coming. Maybe he, I'm sure he thought that, right? And, and maybe he was just anxious and waiting. I find it ironic that Eli calls Samuel's son because this son actually he raised up in the right way, but it was a son that God had put in his life. His biological sons, he failed at raising, and, and it eventually cost them to it ended up in their death. Um, that's a huge difference in the way that he meant that God allowed him to raise up and train Samuel, um, showed him how to discern the voice of God, how to discern, discern that calling. Like I hope I get to do for my son one day to right. learn to discern that calling, right? Um, verse 18 says, It is the Lord, or Samuel told him, every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth good. Eli understood the judgment was for him, for his sons, for his descendants. I don't know how he handled it the way he did. I, I don't know. That, that, that's, that's another way he was a great example in, to Samuel. was because not just that he, not just that he uh, had changed and he had done better, but when God's judgment came, he didn't argue. He didn't fight. He, he took it gracefully or humbly. He just said, okay, if that's the Lord's will, then that's okay. And that's hard. That's hard that's to do, right. especially when the judgment is coming upon your entire family. Right. The entire line of your home is coming. The, ju the judgment is coming. The judgment said his sons would die in a day. All these different things are coming. And he's like, okay, if that's the Lord's will. And that had to speak volumes to this young Samuel who is learning to discern the things of God and to be this, this thing that God wants him to be. And he lay there awake all night, scared to death to tell the man of God that God's judgment was finally coming upon his home. And instead, when he comes to tell him, he probably thought Samuel would freak out or, or that Eli would freak out or, or act irrational or whatever. And all he said was, okay, if that's the Lord's will, then that's okay. And, and for one last time or however many times, he got to be a, a great influence to Samuel and show him that. Um, he just accepted what God's will was. And that just, the whole time, this whole lesson just echoes to me that like his sins came back up before God. Like the, the time of judgment came for the sins that he had committed. Not even just his sins, but the sins of his sons came up and then the sins of his neglect and his uh, inability to rebuke and discipline his children came up against him again. And I'm so thankful to Jesus that my sins are not remembered, that he yes. forgets them. He choo The Bible says he chooses not to remember them. Yes. David called it the sea of forgetfulness. That's where our sins are at. Somewhere in a sea of God's forgetfulness he doesn't recall them, not even for your benefit, but for his. Because he doesn't, he chooses not to remember them and chooses not to hold that against you when he looks at you. He sees Jesus. When he looks at you, he sees Jesus. Jesus took on your sin, your, your wickedness, and you put on Christ's righteousness. And when the Father looks at you, he sees his son. And that is a miracle. That is a blessing from God. And you need to take advantage of that because that is, that is the calling. The same way God called Samuel, the same way God at one point talked to Eli for the first time, He can talk to you and He's calling out to you. And you are able, even today, right now, He is always calling. You are able to accept that call, to take on 
Jesus' righteousness. And it will be the greatest thing you've ever done. And if you have done it, then it is your responsibility and your job to go out and tell this world that same exact thing. That is your job. To take that. To be a mentor. To be able to teach. To be able to show and guide and lead people to Jesus. Not be selfish and keep salvation for yourself. But to tell a lost and dying world that without Jesus, they are going to die and go to hell. And that you have the ability to at least speak that into their lives. To tell them there's a different way. Amen. That's all. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for another opportunity to stand up here, Lord. I want to say thank you again to all the fathers that are in here today and for you, Lord. I'm so thankful for you've been like more of a father to me, Lord, than I've ever had. I'm so thankful for that. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just continue to bless the rest of this day. Be, be with Brother Bill, Lord, as he brings us this sermon that you've given to him, Lord. And I just love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.